Hello, hello. Testing, testing. Pr always praying to the technology gods that this stuff works. Um, I'm going to wait a few seconds while uh, people trickle in, but this will be recorded, put up on the YouTube with captions eventually. Uh, but I wanted to do a follow-up to my last live dream. Um, because I noticed in my students, clients, relationalities that there's definitely a consistency of missing certain connection points in what I'm talking about and how I'm practicing. And so this is going to be a very functional, hopefully non-theoretical explanation of what the title says, which is how to maintain a practice of non-duality while engaging with critique. Um, a first a brief overview. Um, non-duality in the West tends to become co-opted by whiteness very quickly, which leads to a feeling of peace as opposed to conflict or tension, um, which actually harms the most marginalized people in the world who are fighting against oppression for their liberation. On the other side of that, people who are highly um, sort of activated, uh, let's say, in rage and anger whether it's righteous or ignorant, doesn't matter, tend to sometimes fall into a kind of negativity bias trap, which is just another form of dualism. It's just dualism for liberation. Um, both of these sort of patterns are not what I'm talking about. But I am aware and part of a society and cultural structure and biology that falls into habitual traps because of how physiology functions. So hopefully I will unpack all of that um, in this talk, and uh, I will read from this spaciousness book again, so that we can have different ways of experiencing what I'm trying to describe with my words. So, the first thing we have to kind of wrestle with is that our physiology is very hungry and we contract around any sensation or phenomenon that appears to threaten us. So we perceive threat in some way. Lack, scarcity, hunger, starvation, malnourishment, um, physical violence, emotional violence. We perceive any number of threats whether they're real or not is up for debate, but we perceive it and then we contract and then we have protective survival actions, which can sometimes be addictions that we use to protect what we think we need to protect. And part of that is just normal and part of that is a fantasy that we're creating that creates its own kind of reality tunnel. So let's get into just some brief practice. Um, the first thing that we have to do, let me line it out for you, is that we have to start to train our systems to go from negativity bias to positivity bias. This is not the end goal, so don't get it twisted. Because if we stopped here, we would be just like the people I talked about who are unable to deal with difficulty because it's somehow not peaceful enough for them. So we have to understand this kind of reality um, a little bit but but we have to feel feelings 
and sensations without necessarily believing the narratives about those feelings or sensations. So, there are two general ways to do this, very large categories. One is um, with their eyes open and one is with your eyes closed, okay? So understand that a lot of this is like a recipe, you can bake your own cake with it, but I'm just trying to give some basics here. Um, let's do an eyes open practice. So I just happen to be outside, it happens to be a little bit sunny, it's still kind of cold. Um, I'm looking around, and what I do when I look around or listen or use my senses externally, I'm going to sort of try to find something that gives me joy or pleasure or peacefulness or some kind of thing that I like, some kind of sensation or positive affect that I like, okay? I prefer it, okay? So I prefer, I see the sun on this green grass and something about the sun, the warmth on my face, and the green of the grass makes me feel good. Without thinking about why, like I'm not trying to create a narrative about that, I'm feeling the feeling and I'm absorbing it and I'm relaxing into it. The relaxation part is key because we don't want to ingrain and entrain our system to have to strive to feel good. We don't want striving and feeling good to be linked because then when we're tired or fatigued or oppressed or injured, we're not going to be able to feel good because we can't, we don't have the energy to strive for it. So that's a big part of this is that it's easy, it's immediate. And it's, I'm not doing anything, but I'm stopping doing something. I'm not adding to my load. And if I was not here talking to you, I would just be basking in the feeling of goodness that is this present moment focus. Not about the past, not about the future not thinking about past and future. So let's keep going with it because it feels good. If it stops feeling good, I would change my focus. I would have to find something new, but this is maintaining its benevolence towards me. So I'm going to continue allowing it to penetrate and uh, absorb that penetration, that feel, that contact. I can feel it. I can feel the green somehow by the visual uh, cortex or whatever. I can feel the heat on my skin. I can feel the crows um, in the sky, in the trees. I can hear them. I can feel that vibration. And remember, I'm not creating a narrative about it. I'm not saying anything about it. I'm not trying to determine some cosmological fantasy about why this present moment is good for me. I'm just experiencing the naturalness of it, the natural goodness, the good naturalness, right? And what happens when we feel that? We tend to take a physiological sigh or we tend to relax. We, our breathing becomes slower and longer and deeper. And then we can continue that. Oh, I like it when my breath is slower, longer, and deeper. So I'm going to consciously, like union, become a union with that. I'm going to consciously work together with that and play with that. Now, if you're doing this 20 times a day, you're going to get very good at it. But if you're only doing this once a month or once a week or once a day, it's going to feel extremely tense to do this and you're going to feel anxious and so we're going to get to that part because right now we're biasing positive positive feelings but in the trying to absorb the positive many people start to feel bad because they start to have negative self-talk or a negative habit or an addiction comes into play where they get bored or anxious or craving something and then they need to like run away or check their email or, um, you know, fidget or something because there's tension in the system that is like 
um, a backlog of trapped energy or something. I mean, the narratives, you can just make up whatever metaphor you want. It doesn't really matter. So multiple times a day, you want to absorb the chi of goodness naturally without thinking about it. Which is to say, don't concoct stories, or if you have to concoct a story, do that as little as possible and then let it go. Right? I'm a big fan of story, and especially the right story at the right time. There's many wrong stories and wrong narratives that we are constantly being propagandized and proselytized to, preached. And I really do think, this is a little bit of a tangent, but when we absorb the wrong story, we get sick. And this is a very kind of like a folk medicine idea. If we, if we are, stories are like spells and they can be like curses. And if we absorb the wrong nutrition at the wrong time, we can get sick, even if it's good for somebody else or appears good at another time. Because uh, it's all about context and right timing. So you're absorbing this natural chi more often. Okay, so now two things can happen. There's like kind of a branching timeline now. One is that by doing this, your so-called negative experiences are heightened or are brought about. Like I just talked about. You're feeling good and then you feel bad because you're afraid of something or something happens where you're like, I can't relax, right? Um, so then I feel anxious. So there's one sort of tangent. The other tangent is you start to fixate and attach to the thing that's making you feel good and when that goes away or you can't find it, you feel bad and like you can't have a good feeling. So both of these are problems, right, to practice non-duality. If we take the first one, which is a negative feeling comes up, we have to learn to feel that in an expanded way while also feeling good feelings at the same time. This does not mean ignoring the bad feeling that we don't like. It's not really a bad feeling. It's just a feeling we don't prefer. We have to learn to feel it without so much of our storyline about it or so much of the threat. We just learn over time to feel that as an interesting phenomenon. Oh, what is this? Oh, I'm calling it anxiety. But what is it really? Well, it's kind of like a quivering in my chest. It's kind of like a shallow breathing. Okay, cool. You know, go a little bit deeper. Oh, just sit with it. Yeah, I just feel, I feel nauseous. Okay, you know, feel a good feeling now. Okay, can, can you kind of feel the nauseousness as you feel something good in the environment? Maybe you can't at that moment, so you have to go do something else. All of this is contextual moment-to-moment -moment awareness in which you have to have a conversation that is not based on your kind of rumination narrative story. You actually have to be present. You know, just like if you were with a child who was having like a panic attack, you wouldn't want to become like the child having a panic attack in order to help them. Two people panicking is not going to help the kid who is panicking they're panicking and they're having their experience, all you really can do is kind of hold space, know that it's going to be all right, know that it will, it will pass, and know that um, the things you think might soothe that child in that moment might actually trigger them more because they're in a high state of threat. You can't take it personally. Some people will take it personally. And so when you do this to yourself, you have to stop. You have to just pause. You have to just hold presence, breathe. Because none of this chasing after reactive ideas of social normativity is going to help you do this process. Um, this, is a, this is a very different kind of process. Um, yeah, it's not about manners and politeness um, at a certain level. So you're opening up to 
the places that you don't like and you're seeing them as kind of like art. Um, you can look at art you don't like as an artist and actually see benefit in it. You can go, I really don't like this piece of art. It doesn't give me a feeling that I like. I don't like the composition, etc., etc. But at a certain point, as an artist, you can gain some kind of illumination or benefit from anything because you go, okay, what was? Let me just uh, let me just see what what's up with this art. I don't like it from the get go, but what's what is it about it? And you kind of look at it. Oh, let me look at the composition. Let me look at the texture. Let me look at the colors. Let me look at the shapes. Let me look at the content. Let me look at the forms. You sort of look at it from different angles because you're an artist and you enjoy art, even if it's not art that you like. And I think that this is a big step, a stop, a, st a stopping point or a resistance point for many people because they're not looking at things like an artist. They're looking at things like an entitled person. And entitled people don't heal their trauma because you just can contribute more to your fucking sense of entitlement and self selfishness and self centeredness. So you learn through time the habits of mind that are not functional for you to continue to feed. And sometimes you find yourself under various levels of stress feeding those again, but you have to come back to a practice that allows you to stop. Stop feeding the bullshit. Um, when you do this, you are able to enjoy any phenomena, and then eventually you can delight in any phenomena. This is really the cornerstone of the death clown method, which is learning to delight in any phenomenon from a particular vantage point, so that you are not necessarily um, adhering to an ideology about it, but you are looking at actual phenomena, feeling, sensing actual phenomena, and you're saying, what's enjoyable about this? What could be enjoyable about this? So that you can start to understand something about nature itself rather than human social constructs. Human social constructs are fine at a certain point in the ecosystem. Um, but this is much deeper than that. This is about being like an animal, like an elemental force. Um, the hurricane is beautiful even if it destroys somebody's house and kills them uh, because it's a natural phenomenon. You got to get through that. You got to understand that there's a difference between the human grief of loss and the bounty, the bounteous nature of reality. And if you are constantly stopping your practice because you don't feel good, you will not get that far in the practice and you will potentially probably most likely do harm to yourself or others because you're too rigid in your uh, thinking you're, you're not able to experience phenomenon so you shut down things that are just phenomenon you know so that's one part of it the other part I'm going to, that I just spoke about was that if you're, you become attached to the thing that makes you feel good, and then when you can't find it or it's not there, you can't feel good. So this is an addiction that's more obvious. Um, you can become addicted to anything because you're dependent upon it to feel okay. It is what you're using to regulate, therefore you can't regulate without it. This is tough. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little practice about this. So this is what you do. You find something in your environment that gives you immediate satisfaction in the moment. The sun is no longer on my face, so I can't use that anymore. I have to find something else. So I'm going to scan my environment. Of course, this is all eyes open. You can do this stuff eyes closed. It's a little bit different, so maybe you talk about that later in another video. I'm going to find something that gives you immediate satisfaction. I'm, I have to actually find it. So, there we go. Okay, so over here I have some, uh, there's some things on this table, plants and rocks and stuff. Um, there's, some, there's some texture over here that makes me feel good. So, 
I'm going to I'm going to let that in like we talked about before. I'm going to let it in. I'm going to let that feeling in. Oh, that texture, that oh yeah, those colors. Mm, interesting. So now what I'm going to do in the present moment, I'm not going to think about the past or the future, but I'm going to overlay. I'm going to overlay another version of reality. This thing that I am enjoying right now is impermanent. We all know it conceptually. It is impermanent. It will someday be different. It will change. It will transform. It will die. It will disintegrate, right? Someday it will not look or act the way it is acting because the context of everything will be different. So as I am enjoying this, I am going to see its inevitable dissolution. Okay? I'm going to see it essentially die in slow motion in front of me. But I'm not fixating just on my imagination. I'm really with it. This is important. It's an overlay. It's happening at the same time. I'm not having to go, oh, let me imagine that it's... No, because then, then that's your imagination. I want to be with the thing that is giving me pleasure now and as I see that I see it's I see its basic inherent nature of impermanence and I watch that process happen and I feel what I feel and I don't necessarily put any um, I don't put any narrative to it okay that's the hard part for a lot of people because they need to in order to protect themselves from feeling things they don't want to feel, they make up stories that then trap them in new feelings that they don't want to feel. So, I just did that. I can do it with more things. I can do it with plants, I can do it with animals, and then you work up to doing it with people. People that you hate, people that you love, people that you're indifferent about. You gaze at them and you see them die. This is not morbid. If you think it's advanced or morbid, you have a lot of work to do. And I'm just telling you the way it is. Um, everyone's going to die, and it's not really a problem. But we have a feeling about it, and we have to deal with those feelings. So eventually, you do it with yourself in the mirror. You do it with uh, images of people that you love. You can do it with people on TV, if that's helpful for you to titrate. You have to do it, though. You have to really do it so that it becomes a habit. It's a positive habit where you're actually seeing the impermanence of the things that bring you joy. Now, you might now start to see how this is woven together in something that actually helps you maintain non-duality because you're having a positive immediate moment in the now. You're not having to search for the past or the future to feel good. This is extremely important. Then, you're taking that positive affect and watching the source of that positive affect change or die while also maintaining the positive affect. Like watching a sunset, watching the sky, watching something change slowly in front of you, or fast. You can be, go fast or slow, it doesn't matter. And you're feeling those feelings and you're accepting it and you're breathing. Eventually, you'll be able to do this with every phenomenon over time. But what we have to, I'm going to pause here and say there's a very big problem in our society about experts and miracle workers and magical people and experts and authorities where this is not what you ever want to think about yourself. You do not want to position yourself as an expert in these practices that is a trap and it goes against every single capitalist rhetoric we have today about how to survive in this business in this world is to become an authority to become an expert in these practices if you do that you will encounter a whole new host of kind of hell realms that you then have to deal with and you know that's fine too but I'm really careful because this is an ongoing practice 
you have subtler and subtler levels of awakening and opening and relaxation into the impermanent emptiness of phenomenon. And that takes a long time and it's personal. As in, you have your own unique experiences of that. I don't mean it's personal like it helps you reify your selfhood. I just mean every single person has a different kind of uh, pathway through this forest, right? So if you position yourself as an expert or you position me as an expert, you're actually dehumanizing. Or you're dehumanizing yourself and you're dehumanizing me. Because I can't predict any of this. There's no prediction here. There's just maintaining awareness as much as you can in the present moment relationality so that you can actually not fabricate or you can fabricate as little as possible. That's the point is that you're getting to a place where you can fabricate as little as possible over time so that you might be able to open yourself up to witnessing reality as it actually is which I'm not going to go into that here because that's way beyond beginner level for a lot of people and it can cause a lot of issues for people because they haven't they haven't really dealt with things you know and and these processes of non-duality are really about dealing with things as in contacting and encountering reality as it actually is not your fantasy of it and everybody wants fantasy. Everyone wants to improve their lives. Well, sometimes improvement doesn't look like improvement to you. And that's a hard lesson of reality, too, is that we often don't like things, but we don't really know their basic nature, or we don't really know what that means, and we, um, we are very quick to assign judgment. Okay. So let's say that you've managed to bias positive affect a little bit more. You're able to see the intrinsic emptiness in phenomenon, even as you witness it. You're enjoying it in the moment, but you're, you see that it's impermanent. Then you can do that with the things that you don't like. Oh, I really don't like this thing, but I notice that it's impermanent and it will change eventually. I'm going, you know, you're, you're, you're helping yourself through the instability of reality by making this process the stability on some level. Okay, now let's get to the second part of the talk because we had to do all that fucking preamble because there's so many people who don't understand the basics. Um, let's say that you have a moderate practice of non-duality and animism and you're doing that every day and you're ingraining that in your system so that you actually fundamentally view reality differently. You're, you're eating your own stories, you're relating in the present moment, you know how to take care of yourself when you start to feel bad, um, and you're doing that in a way that's mindful and present. Okay, that's a lot just at the big, you know, for a lot of people that seems already like impossible because they're running around trying to escape oppression or perceived threat. So, you know, we're in a tough spot, right? Reactivity is really our bread and butter as human beings. But now let's talk about critique or critical perception or critical inquiry or just the process of social criticism. Okay. So, maintaining non-duality, one engages in duality. That's it. It's pretty fucking simple, but we have to unpack it because people don't really understand it. Um, in engaging with duality, we notice that there are things that we like and things that we don't like, and systemic causes and effects that create harm for the planet, for other beings, for other humans, etc., for ourselves. We can analyze that from a critical lens and experiment with describing why and how we should change things in order 
to make things better for all beings. Selfish people will not care and they will actively attack. <laughs> Just the fucking way it is. You have to deal with you have to understand that this process is an anti-fragile process, which is to say you become stronger in the face of more and more um, violence in a certain sense. It doesn't mean you become stupid, and it doesn't mean that you... Um, yeah, you just have a more nuanced vocabulary around how to help yourself and others while being less selfish and dealing with how afraid you are of things. Let's look at it from a slightly different angle. Everyone wants a quick fix. They want a one-size-fits-all story. Think about it this way, though. If you only ate protein, would you be healthy? The answer is no. If you only ate fat, would you be healthy? The answer is no. If you only ate carbohydrates, would you be healthy? The answer is no. If you only ate vitamin B, B5, would you be healthy? No. If you only... Yeah, right, I could go on and on. If you only ate the mineral zinc, would you be healthy? The answer is no. So if you only engage in peacefulness, the way that you think peacefulness is uh, absence of conflict, will you be healthy? The answer is no. Because real life contains more than one thing, one phenomenon, more than one aspect of reality. Reality is multifaceted. So, when we engage in critique and we essentially stress test our non-duality, we start to be able to actually do both in various ways. We can maintain understanding that all phenomenon is essentially emptiness and comes from basic space and is luminous and um, healthy and, and happy on some non-human level. But then we can also say, and in duality right now, this particular aspect, I'm going to criticize. I'm going to unpack it. I'm going to analyze it. I'm going to critique it. I'm going to be critical with my perception about what this means or what this is doing. What are the effects of this phenomenon or this habit or this behavioral pattern? When we're able to do this, again, if we're stopping positioning ourselves as experts and we're actually just engaging with reality as it is, we can notice phenomenon. We can notice, ah, uh, this whole thing about the internet, it has some toxic aspects. Here's some toxic aspects that I'm noticing. And you just name it, right? I'm being general. But the minute that you name those toxic aspects, there will be a tendency in yourself and others to fixate on dualism. And this is the most difficult part of criticism, is the fixation on dualism. Because everyone wants their idea of liberation. No one wants to feel like they lost the game. Um, so if we go back to non-duality for a second, my teacher Ming, I mean it's a brilliant phrase, realizing the loss of loss. We have to get to a point eventually where we no longer believe in this idea of wins and losses. That we actually lose the idea of loss itself and that's real liberation. The understanding that even though things change or maybe things happen that we don't prefer, there's no problem. And that's real practice. We get to places inside of the practice where we actually feel better without our sense of self, without our memory of history, without this constant reification of the ego self. And from that place, we engage with reality. Even if that reality is dualistic, we engage with it. Because we can see the basic intrinsic goodness of people and we want to help them reach that place. That's it.
it is not really about an ideology at the end of the day, but to kind of walk this path, you kind of have to continually upgrade and update your ideological narrative in order to practice better. At a certain point, all of that disappears. Because the narrative you have about reality is not reality. But it is part of reality, and it is a manifestation of reality. Therefore, you can trace through it into reality. But that place that we're talking about is a place of luminous existence, or unbecoming, or non-becoming, in which you feel the play of energetic forces, but there's no self-consciousness. There's no self-consciousness. And the more self-consciousness we have, the worse everything feels, and the kind of the shittier actions and behaviors we start to take. So the practice of having less and less self-consciousness, but still engaging in the political, social, cultural reality that we're in, that is sort of the way that I practice non-duality. Because I see too many people over the years have used non-duality as a way to bypass and to escape um, relationality in order to achieve some kind of transcendence. And maybe that's their fate, and maybe that's actually okay. I'm just making a choice for myself to practice non-duality and, and encounter and deal with and engage with duality because that's part of non-duality. But non-duality is bigger than duality. It is more primary. It is more real. It is more true. So my priority is non-duality. And I practice my priority of non-duality through engaging with duality in a non-dual way. This does not mean that I'm always great at it, because I'm constantly experimenting. And this absolutely doesn't mean that your perception of my practice is correct. Because, really, I'm talking at a level here that a lot of people really can't follow me. And I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying it's a very particular kind of practicing. If you're still extremely reactive and you can't feel good because you're so traumatized, then everything I'm saying makes would make no sense to you. Because you're just so torn up that you need basic care. And if you can get that basic care, maybe you can proceed along the path in a certain way. But if you're really, really like just learning this stuff and you're highly addicted and you're injured and you're traumatized and you're in a bad relationship, etc., 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 a lot of the stuff I'm saying isn't really applicable to your situation until you can get to a certain stability in your own practice where you're able to sit in a kind of peaceful equanimity and absorb the goodness of reality to a degree that you could then engage better with the things that are difficult. Because we are dealing with difficult things. It's that, you know, that's the whole point of critique is that we're dealing with difficult things and we want things to improve and there are forces, people, institutions, systems that are want that, that want to conserve a certain habit or behavior or way of living. They want to conserve the way things are going because it benefits them. And what critique is trying to do is make things that benefit other people in different ways and spread out the distribution of benefit. And we have to face it that in this level of reality where we live in a world with finite resources and finite energy, um, oh, there's a car horn, um, that we're going to have to deal with things the way they are in this world while also allowing the next world or the other world to come into our awareness more because we are going to die. And that world has different rules than this one. So 
this is a it's a complex it's a complex situation that we're in as humans but I think that we make it worse by pretending to to know more than we do and critique this is probably the last point I'll make before I read this thing so critique think of it this way spiritual inquiry which is what I'm talking about non-duality is a form of spiritual inquiry asking questions of reality asking questions of spirit doesn't mean you get the answers but it's the asking of the question of spiritual inquiry part of spiritual inquiry is spiritual critique there's no way around it in my estimation in order to ask questions you have to critique so spiritual inquiry and spiritual critique are linked they might as well be the same thing you can't escape the process by which you refine and transform your way of experiencing reality you have to just engage in this very personal very deep very unique experiment which sometimes has results you don't like and that helps you build the next next experiment right yeah so I wrote a little thing um, I don't have it with me but I wrote a little thing it's on my Substack notes it's sort of like a pith version of what I just all talked about um, saying that like you have to be the one to be responsible for maintaining your peace while engaging with critique from self or other critique with yourself critique from others critique that I'm saying you have to be able to engage in non-duality or else what you devolve into is a kind of uh, debate or argument or kind of like my fear is more important kind of game that you're playing and it is a game it's a theater but it isn't what I'm inviting like you can have that experience but you're arguing with yourself or you're arguing with God you're not really arguing with me because I don't need to do that um, if you're at a certain level of engagement then we can have really good conversations um, about the nature of reality and how to improve our behaviors and what to maybe take action on otherwise it's just monkeys yelling at each other in a cage in the zoo where everyone feels like shit so they attack each other that's what it's like and that's uh that's the mirror that's being held up to us so uh i don't know let me finish this by reading some more of this book because i think it's helpful i'm going to read the whole first canto which is the first poem the first song and uh yeah, let me read that and then um, I have to figure out where it actually begins. Ah, here it is. Okay, so there's all these preambles and stuff. I'm not going to read that stuff. If you want to get the book, you read it for yourself. Okay, so let's begin story time. Spaciousness. Samsara and Nirvana never stir from their intrinsic spaciousness. Everything arises in the vast matrix of spontaneity, and spontaneity is the ground of all, but empty in essence, never crystallizing, although appearing as everything, the ground is nothing. Samsara and Nirvana arise as spontanea in the Trikaya matrix, yet they can never stir from their intrinsic spaciousness, for such are the blissful fields of reality. The nature of mind is an unchanging, sky-like supermatrix, a matrix of variable display, compassionate, magical emanation. Everything is ornamentation of spaciousness and nothing else. It is the creativity of luminous mind, pulsating outward and inward, being nothing at all, yet appearing as everything whatsoever. And it paints magnificent, amazing, magical emanation. Outside and inside, and the material and spiritual dimensions, are ornaments of spaciousness arising as the wheel of sublime form. All sounds and speech, 
everything that vibrates, are ornaments of spaciousness arising in essence as sublime vibration. All movement of thought and all inconceivable non-thought are ornaments of spaciousness arising as the wheel of sublime mind. And the six fields of dualistic sense perception of the universe, appearing in their own spaciousness like magical illusion, do not truly exist. Baseless, vividly apparent, yet empty in the now, supremely spacious. With natural clarity, they appear as decoration of their intrinsic spaciousness. No matter what the perception arising in this vast spaciousness, in its unremitting sameness, it is the dharmakaya of luminous mind. Disposed in the now, empty in itself, unchanging, unsublimating, as self-sprung awareness in the now, reality itself, effortlessly, passively, is part of the one blissful matrix. In its unchanging intrinsic clarity, it is Sambhokakaya, and however it manifests, it is spontaneity, uncontrived and unalloyed in its unremitting sameness. Whatever the shape of the distinct multifarious display, its reality is self-sprung emanation, magical projection, and it never strays from the non-action of the all-good. In the fail-safe luminous mind, the unfabricated trikaya is already perfected. Not stirring from spaciousness, its spontaneity uncompromised. The activity of Buddha and Buddha fields is already perfected. The matrix of sublime spontaneity dawns in the now. Universal multiplicitous diversity perfected in the now. This field of unalterable, unsublimating spontaneity in the now, this is the visible reality of intrinsic spaciousness, non-crystallizing knowledge arising to ornament that spaciousness. Already arrived, nothing to do, without any practice, like the sun in the sky, that is an amazing, superb reality. Here in this womb-like spaciousness in the spontaneity of the now, samsara is all good, and while nirvana is also good, in this all-good matrix in the now, neither samsara nor nirvana exist. Appearances are all good, and while emptiness is also all good, in this all-good matrix in the now, neither appearance nor emptiness exist. Life is all good. And while good and bad feelings are also all good, in this all-good matrix neither life nor feelings exist. Self and other are both all good, and while acceptance and rejection are also all good, in this all-good matrix no self and other, no affirmation or negation is possible. In delusion, we reify what is not truly existent and label it. Why is it that we so readily affix attributes to samsara and nirvana when their nature is dreamlike, baseless, and evanescent? Everything is all good. Magnificent spontaneity. And delusion never having existed in the past, existing neither in the present nor the future, life is just a label, the paradox of being and non-being resolved. No one has ever been deluded anywhere in the past. No one is deluded now, and no one will be deluded in the future. That is alpha pure vision of past, present, and future. When delusion is non-existent, non-delusion cannot exist. And spontaneously in the now, pure presence is right here. Since there never was release, is no release now, and never will be, nirvana is a mere label, and no one has ever known liberation.
there can be no release because oppression cannot exist in the now. And pure like the sky, nothing can ever be restricted or localized. That is alpha pure vision of ultimate liberation. In short, in the spontaneity of this vast womb-like spaciousness, what seems to be samsara or nirvana is a display of creativity that at its very inception is neither samsara nor nirvana. Further, no matter what dream arises in the creativity of sleep, it is in truth an absence, a blissful rest in natural presence, smoothly spaced out in vast, unremitting sameness. Hmm. It's very important to hold on loosely to those feelings of spaciousness while engaging in the dream called samsara and called oppression, called duality. Another way that I like to think about it is like a dream warrior. So I love science fiction, fantasy, comic books, and stuff. I love them. I love them for what they tell me about reality, being non-reality. So one of the stories that I like to sort of feel into in myself is like a story where there is a character who is, um, you know, on a journey or a challenge. They have to do something. They have to help others. And they're wandering, and they're not in charge of their wandering. And they appear in different dreams. And wherever they appear, they have to find out what their mission or what, how they have to help in that dream. So if they appear in the dream of hell, that's the job. If they appear in the dream of heaven, that's the job. And there are many hells and many heavens and it's always different than what you think. But this character wakes up every day in a different dream and they have to figure out their purpose there. And then they wake up in another dream and they figure out their purpose there. And it's kind of a funny little concept because we, we have television shows like this, like Quantum Leap or something, right? But I really do feel that reality is like this, that this kind of changing shape of everything and we find ourselves, spirit finds itself as us, as the character of us in whatever place that is and must work with that but that will change when I die I don't know what's going to happen but I'm preparing for the potentiality that I would just wake up in a different version of something and have to still get on with it I would still have to deal with it and do my job whatever that job is I think that it's useful because even if we're very stressed out, you have to realize that you're on a kind of adventure. And it's not a solo adventure, it's a collective adventure. But I think sometimes when we are alone in our thoughts, we need a little boost to try to reframe the situation in a more useful way. And I think that that's one of the ways that I reframe it, is that like, I'm just here, I've appeared in this dream right now that seems stable, but then there are other times where I appear in dreams that are less stable, but the job is always the same kind of job. You just kind of have to encounter reality as it is, whether that, whether you like it or not. And, you know, I'm not saying that we all should, you know, rush out 
to, uh, you know, raise our adrenaline and do some kind of crazy thing. I'm just saying that should the need arise, that might be exactly what we're meant to do. And as we watch other people in the world be subject to punishment beyond beyond our sense of, you know, anything, like it's senseless violence, we can't bypass by saying, oh, that's just a dream. We have to actually engage with it and go, in this part of reality, this is real. And I'm going to engage with it. I'm really going to engage with it. Knowing that when people die, something else happens. And we should still engage with that too. So, you know, my conception of death is that it's liberation, but that can be interpreted a lot of ways for a lot of different people. So I can't tell you that your version of death is liberation. What I can say is that I'm working on this. I'm playing with impermanence and pain and fear and hunger and death. Hopefully this was useful to you. I'm still going to engage in critique people are still not going to have the capacity to engage in critique with me in a way that feels good for myself or them, and that's still going to happen. But I'm still going to engage in critique, and I'm still going to practice non-duality, and I hope that you do too. I hope you find your way in to this kind of practice, and I hope that this uh, talk today has given you some ideas of how you can apply this in your own life because I'm just talking about how I apply it in mine. So may this have benefited all beings everywhere. May the merit go to where it needs to go. May the, may the energy move how it needs to move. And um, that's the end for today. <laughs>